story thirteen of the human boy and the war by eden philpotts this librivox recording is in the public domain story thirteen the last of mitchell there is a great deal of difference between being expelled and invited to find another sphere for your activities in fact as my father said if dr dunstan had expelled me he would certainly have made a row about it and very likely have written to the newspapers but old dunstan was a jolly sight too wily for that he wrote to my father when the event happened and said that circumstances had come to his ears which made him think etc etc and that i had better leave merivale i am mitchell and my father is a financier and i may say that this profession embraces a great many branches sometimes after dinner and holidays he has allowed me to stop and smoke a cigarette while he talked to friends and so i have got a gradual inkling of what it means to be a financier and in a way this inkling was my downfall not that i felt it a downfall really to be hoofed out of merivale for it was rather a potty sort of show and i should have gone to a far more swagger place if my father had been flusher just at the time when i had to go somewhere owing to a trifling bother at another school but i went to merivale and just because i tried to take advantage of what my father had said about finance and apply it to school life the difficulties arose i gathered off and on from my father when he was in a talkative frame of mind that one of the great arts of a financier is to do deals between other people for instance you have something to sell and my father knows it and he roots about and leaves no stone unturned as they say until he finds somebody who wants to buy just what you want to sell then having found you a customer my father arranges all the details of the business and everybody is satisfied and my father for all his time and trouble gets richly rewarded then again another fine branch of the financier's art is the floating of public companies to float a company requires great skill and nerve the first thing is to find a place a long way off far beyond the reach of intending shareholders in fact then you discover this far-off country is extraordinarily rich in minerals or india rubber or manure or some other useful material which everybody wants you send out a mineral or manure expert to the far-off country and he is delighted to find these things in enormous quantities and sees at a glance that if properly managed they will produce dividends of very likely a hundred per cent for the first year and much more afterwards then my father or whoever it might be is glad and he goes about to other skilful men who understand companies and they collect together and make a board the more famous financiers there are among this board the better the public likes it and so the company is floated and the public is invited to put in money this the public is only too thankful to do because of course the thing promises so well and then the shares are quoted on the stock exchange and the papers are suddenly full of the company some morning and the board sits and has a champagne luncheon and arranges its salaries and so on of course the people who have found that happy far-away land flowing with minerals and manure and such like are richly rewarded as they deserve to be and sometimes they take it in money and sometimes in shares and sometimes in both and all may or may not go well but the financier whose business it is to do these things and float the company takes care to come out of it all right in any case otherwise it is no good being a financier there was once a very fine company floated by my father and several of his scientific friends for extracting gold from salt water it was based on thoroughly sound principles because science has proved that there is so much gold in every ton of salt water and of course if it is there it can be extracted by modern inventions so my father and others of even greater renown were filled with the idea of promoting a company to do this it was a brilliant and successful company in a way but did not last long for some reason they started at a place near market i think with pumps and tubes to draw in the water and machinery and professional chemists to get the gold out of it and a staff of twenty skilled men who understood the complicated mechanism and they easily got enough gold from somewhere to make the prospectus and also enough to make a brooch for the manager's wife and no doubt they would have got much more in course of time 
but something failed the water in the english channel was a bit off or some other natural cause and my father said it would have been far better for everybody concerned if the works had been put up in the isle of skye or perhaps in norway or in the west indies or the fiji islands where conditions might have been better suited to success but gold was none the less made for my father and one or two others though not from the sea as my father said thoughtfully when discussing the winding up of the affair there is another and even higher branch of the financier's art the loftiest of all in fact this consists in floating loans for hard-up monarchs and it is absolutely the biggest thing the financier does it wants great skill and delicacy you can also float loans for hard-up nations if you understand how to do it but there are hundreds of financiers who never reach these dizzy heights of the profession just as there are hundreds you may say millions of soldiers who never get above being colonels and thousands of clergymen who fall short of becoming bishops my father of course understood these high branches of his profession and once even went so far as to be interested in a loan for a south american republic but before the thing was matured one side of the republic was destroyed by a volcano and the other side by insurgents who shot the president and all his best friends and these events so shook the investors in general that they would not subscribe to that loan though the republic in its financial extremities offered fabulous rates of interest i mention my father at such great length just to show the man he was and to explain my own bent of mind which lay in the same direction he said once in a genial mood that no man had ever made more bricks without straw than he had it seemed to me a very dignified and original profession because you are on your own so to say and you go out into the world single-handed and by simple force of a brilliant imagination and hard work win to yourself an honourable position you may even get knighted or baroneted if your financial genius is crowned with sufficient success to give away a few tons of money to a hospital or the party chest whatever that is so understanding all these things fairly well it was natural that i took the line i did in the affair of prothero minimus and young maine and whatever the doctor thought my father didn't see any objection to the operation and of course his opinion was the only one i cared about it was like this young maine though very poor had a most amazing knack of prize-winning he was in a class where all the chaps were a year older than him and yet he always beat them with the greatest ease he was good all around and thought nothing of raking in prizes term after term in fact it seemed a thousand pities seeing that he was very poor and the only son of a lawyer's clerk that his great prize-winning powers were not yielding a better return for not to put too fine a point upon it as they say the prizes at merivale were piffle of the deepest dye and of no money value worth mentioning dr dunstan went on getting the same books term after term and simply unreadable slush was all you could call them the few things that were good were all back numbers like robinson crusoe all right in themselves but nobody wants to read them twice and then there were school stories that would have made angels weep especially one called st winifred's in which boys behaved like girls and blushed if anybody said anything dashing then there were books about birds and animals and insects and for the lower school the doctor used to sink to peter parley and the peep of day and such like absolute mess of a bygone age these things were all bound in blue leather and had a gold owl stamped upon them which was the badge of merivale i believe the owl was supposed to be the bird of athena and stood for wisdom or some such rot anyhow it wasn't a bad idea in its way for a more owlish sort of school than merivale i never was at and young maine got more of these books than anybody but to him they were as grass and he thought nothing of them whereas prothero minimus had never won a prize in his life and wanted one fearfully not for itself but for the valuable effect it would have on his mother she was a widow and loved prothero minimus best of her three sons the others had taken prizes and were fair flyers at school but prothero minimus was useless except at running 
so woman-like just because he couldn't get a prize anyhow his mother was set on his doing so and promised him rare rewards if he would only work extra hard or be extra good or extra something and so scare up a blue book with a gold owl at any cost well if you have a financial mind you will see at a glance that here was a possible opportunity at least so it looked to me because on the one hand was young Maine, always fearfully hard up, and always getting prizes at the end of each term as a matter of course, while on the other hand was Prothero Minimus, never hard up, but never a scholastic success, so to say, from the beginning of the term to the end, and of course never even within sight of a prize of any sort. Here, it seemed to me, was the whole problem of supply and demand in a nutshell, and the financier instinct cried out in me, as it were, that I ought to be up and doing. So I went to young Maine and said that I thought it was a frightful pity all his great skill was being chucked away, and bringing no return more important than the mournful things that he won as prizes. And he said, My time will come, Mitchell. And then I told him that a time had come i know you sell your prizes for a few bob at home and that you think nothing of them i said but i had a bit of a yarn with that kid prothero yesterday and it seems that what is nothing to you would be a perfect godsend to him you may not believe it but his mother who is a bit dotty on him has promised him five pounds if he will bring home a prize five pounds said Maine. the best prize old dunn ever gave wasn't worth five bob she doesn't want to sell it she wants to keep it for the honour and glory of prothero minimus i explain and the idea in my mind in bringing you chaps together for your mutual advantage was firstly that you should let prothero have one of your prizes to take home in triumph to his mother and secondly that he should give you a document swearing to let you have two pounds of his five pounds at the beginning of next term Maine was much interested at this suggestion and knowing that he must be a snip for at least two prizes if not three at the end of the summer term he had no difficulty whatever in falling in with my scheme we were allowed to walk in the playing fields on sunday after chapel before dinner and then Maine and prothero minimus and myself discussed the details funnily enough they were so full of it between themselves that they did not exactly realize where i came in so i had to remind prothero that it was i who had arranged the supply when i heard about his demand and i had also to remind him he had certainly said that if anybody could put him in the way of a prize he would give that person a clear pound at the beginning of next term i also had to remind Maine that he had promised me ten shillings on delivery of his two pounds in fact before the day was done i got them both to sign documents because as i say when they once got together over it they seemed rather to forget me so i explained to them that my part was simply that of a financier and that many men made their whole living in that way arranging supplies for demands and bringing capitalists together in a friendly spirit but not for nothing they quite saw it but thought i asked too much however i was older than they were and speedily convinced them that i had not there was only one difficulty in the way after this and prothero came to me about it and i helped him over it free of charge he said when i take home the prize what shall i say it's for you know what my school reports are like there's never a loophole for a prize of any kind well you might say good conduct i suggested but prothero minimus scorned the thought that would give away the whole show at once he said because even my mother wouldn't be deceived it's no good taking back a prize for good conduct when the report will be sure to read as usual no attempt at any improvement which is how it always does anything i suggested prothero scoffed at in the same way so i could see the prize would have to be for something not mentioned at all in the school report of course you don't get book prizes for cricket or footer or running which especially the latter were the only things that prothero minimus could have hoped honestly to get a prize for but i stuck to the problem and had a very happy idea three nights before the end of the term i then advised prothero to say the prize was for calisthenics there are no prizes for calisthenics at Maribel, but it sounded rather a likely subject especially as he was a dab at it and anyway he thought it would satisfy his mother and be all right 
so that was settled and it only remained for maine to get his lawful prizes and hand over the least important to prothero minimus it all went exceedingly well at the start and young maine got the prizes and gave prothero the second which was for literature the thing was composed entirely of poems longfellow or southey or some such blighter and prothero said that his mother would fairly revel to think that he had won it he packed it in his box after breaking up and we exchanged our agreements and it came out when all was over that young maine was to have two pounds out of prothero's five and i was to have ten bob from maine and a pound from prothero thirty shillings in all and prothero would have the prize and two pounds not to mention other pickings that would doubtless be given to him by his proud and grateful mother you might have thought that nothing would go wrong with a sound financial scheme of that sort i put any amount of time and thought into the transaction and as it was my first introduction into the world of business so to speak and i stood to net a clear thirty shillings naturally i left no stone unturned as they say to make it a brilliant and successful affair and yet it all went to utter and hopeless smash though it was no fault of mine and you certainly wouldn't blame prothero minimus or maine either in fact prothero must have carried it off very well when he got home and the calisthenics went down all right and maine when his people asked how it was that he hadn't got more than one prize was ingenious enough to say that he'd suffered from hay fever all the term and been too off colour to make his usual haul so everything would have been perfection but for the idiotic and footling behaviour of prothero minimus's mother this excitable and weak-minded woman was not content with just quietly taking the prize and putting it in a glass case with the prizes won in the past by prothero's brothers she must go fluttering about telling his wretched relations what he'd done and as if that was not enough she got altogether above herself and wrote to dr dunstan about it she said how glad and happy it had made her and that success in the gymnasium was something to begin with and that she hoped and prayed that it would lead to better things and that they would live to be proud of prothero minimus yet and such like truck well the result was a knock-down blow to us all as you may imagine and the doctor showed himself both wily and beastly as usual for he merely asked prothero's mother to send back the prize at the beginning of the term as he fancied there might have been some mistake but he begged her not to mention the matter to prothero minimus so when prothero and maine and myself all arrived again for the arduous toil of the winter term and maine and i were eager for the financial disbursements to begin we heard the shattering news that at the last moment prothero hadn't got his fiver it was to have been given to him on the day that he came back to school but instead his mother had merely told him that she feared there was a little mistake somewhere and that she couldn't give him his hard-earned cash till dr dunstan had cleared the matter up needless to say that dunstan did clear it up with all the brutality of which he was capable as for myself when the crash came i hoped it would happen to me as it often does to professional financiers in real life and that i should escape as it were not of course that i had done anything that in fairness made it necessary for me to escape because to take advantage of supply and demand is a natural law of self-preservation and everybody does it as a matter of course not only financiers but much to my annoyance the common-sense view of the thing was not taken and i found myself in the cart as they say with young maine and prothero minimus the doctor on examining prothero's prize for calisthenics instantly perceived that it was in reality young maine's prize for literature but evidently anything like strategy of this kind was very distasteful to the doctor in fact he took a prejudiced view from the first and as young maine was only eleven and prothero minimus merely ten and a half it instantly jumped to dunstan's hateful and suspicious mind that somebody must have helped them in what he called a nefarious project and by dint of some very unmanly cross-questioning he got my name out of maine i never blamed maine in fact i quite believed him when he swore that it only slipped out under the treacherous questions of the doctor but the result was of course unsatisfactory in every way for me 
i was immediately sent for and had no course open to me but to explain the whole nature of financial operations to dr dunstan and try to make him see that i had simply fallen in with the iron laws of supply and demand needless to say i failed for he was in one of his fiery and snorting conditions and above all appeal to reason it was an ordinary sort of transaction sir i said and i don't see that anybody was hurt by it in fact everybody was pleased including mrs brotherow this made him simply foam at the mouth i had never been what you may call a great success with him and now to hear sound business views from one still at the early age of sixteen fairly shook him up he ordered me to go back to my class and when i had gone he flogged young Maine and prothero minimus he then forgave them and told them to go and sin no more and the same day doubtless after the old fool had cooled down a bit he wrote to my father and put the case before him though not quite fairly and said that apparently i had no moral sense and a lot of other insulting and vulgar things in conclusion he asked my father to remove me that i might find another sphere for my activities and my father did he never took my view of the matter exactly but he certainly did not take dr dunstan's view either he seemed to be more amused than anything and was by no means in such a wax with dr dunstan as i should have expected he said that the scholastic point of view was rather stuffy and lacked humour and then he explained that i had certainly not acted quite on the straight but had been a deceitful and cunning little bounder i was a good deal hurt at this view and when he found a billet for me in the firm of messrs martin and moss stockbrokers i felt very glad indeed to go into it and shake off the dust of school from my feet as they say it is a good and a busy firm and i have been here a fortnight now ten days ago happening to pass mr martin's door and catching my name i naturally stood and listened and heard an old clerk tell mr martin that i was taking to the work like a duck takes to water i am writing this account of the business at merivale on sheets of the best correspondence paper of messrs martin and moss they would not like it if they knew but they won't know End of story 13. End of The Human Boy and the War by Eden Philpotts.